Mike, you're muted. Always got to have one mistake. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Mike Jacob, uh, co-chair of the webinar committee. Uh, welcome to this April edition of our Wednesday webinar series. Um, as Bobby mentioned earlier, today we have an encore presentation, a sequel really, to one of our most popular talks, Who's in Your Garden? The Life and Times of Insects All Around Us. Uh, MPSNJ members were asked to submit photos of insects found in their gardens and yards, or maybe on field trips, who knows? And tonight they will be identified as friend or foe. <laughs> And our, our presenter, once again, one of our most popular presenters, is Dr. Randy Eckel. Uh, Randy is past president of the MPSNJ. She's the current vice president of the MPSNJ. And she's the longtime board entomologist of NPSNJ. And she is founder and owner of Toad Shade Wildflower Farm. Now, Randy knows her bugs. Randy knows her plants. And she can put it all together for us. Welcome, Randy. Thanks so much for that intro, Mike. Let me go ahead and share my slides here and get us uh, get us going. Let's see here. Can everybody see that? Well, everybody can't answer me, but Mike can answer me. All right, everything looks good. Um, so yes, this is this is part two um, of this presentation. Uh, last spring, I think this the idea for this presentation was actually Bobby Herb's idea. Um, and, you know, we put out a call for folks to send me pictures of insects and, and I was just buried under an avalanche of insect pictures and creature pictures. Um, even some from as far afield as, uh, last year, I think the furthest afield was California, the deserts of California this year. I, I got a picture from Kenya. I apologize. I did not identify the insect from Kenya, but, um, but regardless, um, I want to thank everyone for having shared their pictures. Uh, some some of the photos have just been extraordinary. Um, some of the the photos that have worked with other persons' photos have worked so wonderfully, um, and it's been a great joy, a lot of fun actually, putting together this presentation. So let's get going. Uh, see where we go here with who's in your garden too: the life and times and the insects and others all around us. This front photo, by the way, I do want to give a shout out to Lucy Hooper, who managed to, um, I'll give her special mention because she was also the first photo in last year's presentation. Uh, Lucy takes some great pictures and there'll be a few more of hers uh, as we go through today. This is a swamp milkweed beetle. And I'll be talking about the swamp milkweed beetle a little bit later in the presentation. Of course, you know, now the, the advance, it's not working, but let's go. There we go. So, creatures among us. For those of you that were with us last year, um, you've you've seen this slide before. The background was a little bit different, but there are an awful lot of insects in the world, uh, and there's almost as many undescribed insects as there are described insects. Four thousand different species of spiders in North America. The number of insects per square acre, just the top five inches of soil in Pennsylvania, 130 million insects. So what this tells us is that there are a lot of insects out there in our gardens, in our fields, in our forests. And it also tells us that there are so many insects out there that it's impossible for me to know all of them. So <laughs> I do not know all the insects, but, um, I have been studying insects for a very long time in my life, and um, I've done my very best to try to identify a lot of the really interesting insects that you folks sent me photos of. And why, why do we care about native plants and native insects, quite frankly? Well, insects are at the very bottom of the food chain. They take the energy that is captured by plants and they turn it into food and complex proteins that are then eaten by birds and mammals and other creatures. They're at the base of the food chain. And native plants can support native insects in ways that, that non-native plants simply cannot. Um, you know, gone 
gone need to be the days where we go to the garden center and we look for non-native plants that are labeled as pest free. They're pest free, it means no one's eating them. No one like this unknown caterpillar on false indigo. I will tell you, I looked at lists of various insects, various caterpillars that feed on false indigo. This caterpillar is not one of them. Um, it points out the fact that there is so much we don't know. The previous slide where I was talking about the number of undescribed insects, even described insects, even described moths. If you go to, oh, for example, uh, butterflies and moths um, of North America, lists species after species. And for a lot of the moths, the host plant for the caterpillars is still unknown. There is so much we don't know. And of course, whenever I talk about insects eating plants, I need to say, no, I'm not expecting you to all have plants in your gardens that look like this. Um, when you have a situation that looks like this, this is usually an invasive species. Native insects don't usually feed like this. What we're looking at here actually is the viburnum leaf beetle, which is an alien introduced insect, um, along with the spongy moth, formerly the gypsy moth, the Japanese beetle, the scarlet lily beetle, and now the European columbine sawfly. All of these and more are invasive species um, that tend to sometimes do quite a lot of damage. But our native insects don't do that. They tend to hide because they don't want to be food themselves. All right, enough for the, the ads about, about why, why we need to talk about these things. Let's, let's talk about a little bit about the actual insects. First of all, and this is something I didn't talk about last year. Insects are divided into orders. And each order, if you, if you remember when you went to school, you know, kingdom and phylum and order and family, we break down all kinds of living things into different groups. And insect orders are very broad groups. And depending on who you ask, there's either 26 or greater than 30 orders that are recognized right now. You know, things like beetles up the time. You know, let's see, I'll use my pointer here. Beetles, you know, coleoptera. You know, people know about beetles. Zoraptorans, aka the angel insects. I'm willing to bet that most of you have never heard of a zoraptoran. I was joking the other day. It sounded like a, a new religion, perhaps. But regardless, these are all the different types of insects writ broadly. And by the way, it's a cute little two marked tree hopper in the middle there. Isn't that adorable? But some of these insects are not insects that you're likely to see in your garden. So down on the bottom left there, rock crawlers, which is an order of insects that was only discovered in Africa in 2001. Well, they've only actually been found in Africa so far. You're not going to find any rock crawlers in your vegetable garden or your fruit garden or your field or your forest or your meadow or your pollinator garden. Ice bugs, bottom right hand corner. No, you're not going to see any ice bugs either. They are found in North America, but only the Pacific Northwest and Western Canada. All right, so we get rid of those two groups. That still leaves a lot of different kinds of insects. But what if we, uh, oh, and we also looked at spiders last time. But if we look at just the insects, I've highlighted in yellow here, the insects and creatures that we talked about last time. And we skipped a lot of orders of insects. So we talked last time, this was a year ago. We talked about beetles. We talked about some true bugs. Talked about wasps and ants and dragonflies and butterflies and moths, of course, and mantises and spiders. But look at all those groups we didn't even talk about. Hmm. Well, if we look at just the largest orders of insects, I've, I've bolded those and made them bigger. So the largest four orders of insects worldwide are beetles, wasps and ants, butterflies and moths, and flies. We didn't talk about a single fly last year. 
we're going to fix that this time. We're going to talk about a couple flies and we're going to catch a few of these other groups as well. We're not going to get through all of them. Some of these are very specialized insects or very tiny insects that no one sent in pictures of. And some of them uh, unlikely you're going to find in your garden. Fleas are here, the siphonaptera, sure. Fleas, if you have a, you know, insects that are living in your garden because you have mammals nesting in your garden or even a cat that likes to lay in your garden all the time, you might find fleas in your garden. But fleas are not really a normal garden insect because they're going to be living on mammals. But anyhow, I digress. Let's go on and see who we can talk about from the photos that you folks sent in. Well, I thought we'd start with somebody that's familiar. Well, at least the caterpillars are familiar. These are woolly bears. Everybody knows woolly bears. They're, they're in the hand of my friend Deb DeSalvo. She had quite a, quite a year for woolly bears on her farm. But most people have no idea what a woolly bear turns into. Not any idea whatsoever. And what they turn into is an Isabella tiger moth. Isn't that lovely? They come to lights at night, some. Most tiger moths are actually bright white, but the Isabella tiger moth is a fairly good yellow color. And it's a pretty good sized moth. It's probably, oh, inch and a half wingspan at least. Now, Isabella tiger moths, as you might suspect, because of how often we see banded woolly bears around, are not particularly picky eaters. These caterpillars will feed on asters and birches and clover and corn and elm and maples and sunflowers. They're a pretty common insect and a lot of folks are very familiar with them. Most kids are familiar with them. They're not afraid of these caterpillars. Now here's a butterfly that most of you have all seen. These all are very common because their host plant is asters. So you see the butterflies, and we have a picture here, both from Maria Taney and both from, and from Chris Morrow, both I think on Coreopsis, two different species of Coreopsis, nectaring. But you'll notice, and one of the, one of the things that, that throws people off a little bit about insect identification, particularly butterfly and moth identification, is they look different when they fold their wings up. This is a picture of a pair of mating uh, pearl crescents that I took a couple years ago. And you see the underside of the wings looks very, very different. And then of course you have the caterpillar, which no one recognizes. Um, it's funny, people love butterflies in their gardens. They love moths in their gardens mostly, but they're afraid of the caterpillars because they don't know what they are. And, and I'll probably mention this several times, People are afraid of what they don't know or what they don't understand. I want to point out that this photo of the caterpillar, of, I do not personally have a photo of a caterpillar of pearl crescents, um, but I got this from the Snetzinger Butterfly Garden, uh, which is out at Penn State University. Bob Snetzinger was a famous entomologist. Uh, he was the butterfly guy when I was a freshman in college, which was a few years ago. He died a few years ago, but there's a beautiful uh, butterfly garden uh, dedicated to him on a wonderful website, the SnetzingerButterflyGarden.org site, uh, which is a wonderful place to visit to see some really wonderful photos. Here's another example of a butterfly that looks different from the top and the bottom. And I, and I don't want to pick on Maria Taney here at all, but she sent in a picture here. She knew this was a silver spotted skipper. She wasn't sure who this one was. Well, it's also a silver spotted skipper. It's just the other side of it. Um, they have, as do most skippers, they have these crazy looking caterpillars with these fun looking head capsules. Most skippers will web together the leaves and create a chamber or um, uh, a little hiding spot within the leaves to feed. Silver spotted skippers are another one of those not particularly picky caterpillars. Um, 
they have a lot of hosts, but mostly mostly within a group. So they're mostly legumes, uh, woody legumes, um, non-woody legumes. They'll feed on kudzu, which is quite lovely. One of the things that's quite fun about them, which I will always remember, as I was working with the extension program at the University of Maryland while I was working on my master's degree back in the 80s. And they had these crazy looking caterpillars suddenly showing up in soybeans. And nobody knew what they were. This was this was just a conundrum. The silver-spotted skipper, which is perfectly adapted to feed on all these native hosts, suddenly recognized that these giant fields of soybeans were also a legume and reasonably tasty. Um, so this became a sudden problem, but it really threw the extension offices for a bit of a loop. Nobody knew quite what that insect was. Eight spotted forester is another really Fun insect. This uh, picture in the background was sent in by our Vice President Elaine Silverstein. Um, and uh, I want to point out that the eight spotted forester has these little red sort of leg warmers on it. Um, Jacqueline sent in a picture as well. And Chris Morrow, this wonderful picture of the caterpillar. Uh, I've had people not associated with MPSNJ send in pictures of this caterpillar because it's feeding on their Virginia creeper and they're concerned that is going to destroy their Virginia creeper. Native plants that have co-evolved with native insects, they rarely cause that much damage. They're used to each other. Uh, they'll also feed on grape, uh, grape vines, native grape vines. And I just love the Missouri Department of Conservation quote about the eight spotted forester, a spiffy butterfly like moth that dazzles the eye when it flitters around flowers. I suppose one of the other really fun things about the uh, eight spotted forester is it is, in fact, a moth, but it flies during the day. It's one of those oh, rules, I suppose, that we all learn about butterflies and moths is that butterflies fly during the day. And moths only fly at night. And there's a few moths that that break that rule, that absolutely do. I thought I'd talk about the swallowtails just a little bit. Um, we did some swallowtails last year, but I have some different ones to show this year. This is the giant swallowtail. Uh, Joanne Leslie sent in this picture of the giant swallowtail caterpillar here on Garden Roo. Um, it's one of the semi-infamous bird poop caterpillars. Um, it's always fun talking to a group of elementary school kids and getting to talk about bird poop caterpillars. It makes them happy every time. The native hosts of the giant swallowtail um, are primarily common prickly ash, which is found in New Jersey, but is not all that common. And hop tree or common hop tree, Ptilia trifoliata, which is actually very rare in New Jersey. I expect that I first wound up with giant swallowtails in my garden because I had common rue growing in my garden, uh, garden rue. It was given to me by a dear friend of mine uh, who was Lithuanian many, many years ago uh, because it is, um, it's important European folklore, and it's the national herb of Lithuania. Uh, so I have grown rue in my garden for many, many, many years. And as you see here, that's a photo of a giant swallowtail, which really are quite enormous. They are as big as my hand, um, laying eggs on rue in the garden. The first giant swallowtail I ever saw in New Jersey, weirdly was and very sadly was dead in my front yard. Um, it had been hit by a car. Um, and I, I couldn't imagine where this giant butterfly just laying flat in the middle of my lawn had come from, but it didn't take me long to figure out that it had probably been hit by a car crossing the street. Um, but we do get them every year now uh, coming to the garden. And I do have 
both common prickly ash and hop tree now growing on the farm as well. So uh, they do not need to simply rely on the European herb that they will also feed on. Now here's a swallowtail that everybody's a bit more familiar with. Um, and we have some great photos of it. So I wanted to include both the photo from Sarah and the one from Eileen here because it shows a little bit of the color variation between the males. You see the one that Eileen took actually has a lot more blue in it. Um, but also we got this wonderful picture of a caterpillar uh, on service berry. Service berry or shad bush is not normally listed as a host of um, tiger swallowtails, but tiger swallowtails are not actually that choosy. They will, they will feed on a great number of trees. Um, and this was a really nice picture that Peter had. And I put in a picture, a uh, picture of mine actually of the pupa, just to remind myself to talk a little bit about garden cleanup. One of the things that I've been trying to encourage people to do is to clean up their gardens very gently. There is the understanding that um, once we have a day of 50 degrees, it's fine to clean up your garden. Well, all the insects don't all suddenly fly up into the air when it turns 50 degrees. Um, Rebecca McMacken in her uh, TED talk recently clarified that somewhat that really we're talking about soil temperature about 50 degrees, but even when you wait for the soil temperature to turn 50 degrees, still all the insects are not simply going to suddenly leave your gardens. You can clean it up one day and then come back. So I do encourage you to clean things up very gently. Um, the tiger swallowtail, for example, um, it will not, you know, the, the peak flight for the first flight, uh, the first generation of tiger swallowtails isn't around here until about mid-May. So if you go cleaning up your garden, well, you're going to be ruining the pupil stage. You know, if you feel compelled to clean things up, cut them back gently and make sure that you maybe put a brush pile in place and put those sticks and stems, what you're removing from your garden, loosely stacked in a brush pile so that the butterflies and the various insects can still emerge. If we clean up our gardens too thoroughly, we're doing a disservice to the very creatures that we're growing the native plants for. This is really an awesome photo. Um, and I'm looking here and it looks like I left off who the picture was from. Oh my goodness. I believe this was Chris Morrow. Um, the, I will, I will fix that somehow, but I believe this is Chris Morrow's photo of a just emerged red spotted purple. Uh, you can still see the pupil case here that it's holding on to and the exuvial fluid. Um, and also we have a photo here from Mia and Jacqueline showing again, the color variations that you can see. Red spotted purple caterpillars are another bird poop caterpillar. Here we go. Here's a bird poop caterpillar right here on black cherry. There are quite a few different ways that caterpillars mimic things that nothing wants to eat. Um, so they, uh, some of them just look like a stem, some of them look like a stick, some of them blend into the background, and some of them just look like bird poop because they figure the birds aren't going to come and pick up the bird poop. That would be a terrible idea. If you're traveling north, it's actually worth noting that um, you, you see that I gave the subspecies of this butterfly as well. The limonitis... Arthemis, Arthemis, yes, Arthemis, Arthemis. That is, that is the white admiral, which is very, very close related to the red spotted purple, but looks entirely different. It's actually fairly rare in New Jersey, um, but can be found further north. Um, I have seen it in central New York. I'm not sure I have spotted a white admiral in New Jersey before. If I have, I don't remember, but I know I've spotted it in central New York. So folks, as a rule, 
seem to like big butterflies and they like big moths mostly. Um, but they get, as I said, they get creeped out by the other forms. But even sometimes they get creeped out by just the insects themselves. Uh, this is a luna moth. It's an enormous moth. Uh, terrible flyers, quite frankly. Um, we were doing a moth night one night up in Maine. Uh, this was probably, oh, let's see, it was probably pre-COVID, actually, now that I think about it. Um, and I had never realized how poorly Luna Moss would fly through a forest. Um, this thing came came in and it, it didn't know which way was up. It was really sort of, it, it, it was sort of crash landing all over the place and eventually hung on to a tree and we just turned out the light and left it in peace. Um, but they are, they're big, beautiful moths. Their hosts include sumac, persimmon, hickories, sweet gum. I have a fondness for anything that feeds on sweet gum. I grew up on Gumwood Drive. Um, the adults don't feed at all. Several years ago, and I, I think some of you have probably heard me tell this story. Several years ago, uh, I was looking on Facebook, which is a fascinating and sometimes terrifying place. And a woman was afraid to leave her house because she had a luna moth that was on the screen of her door and she was afraid of it. You know, we're afraid of what we do not know. And uh, she was getting a surprising amount of sympathy for being afraid of the giant moth on her um, screen. Several people telling her to kill it. And oh my God, is it, I think somebody said, is it a bat? Is it a bat? Um, and then one very brilliant woman who I'd love to meet someday. I don't know what her name was, but she saved the day and said, oh, Luna Moss, if they land near you, mean good luck. And it's terrible luck to harm one. So consider it, you know, and she went on and on about how this was good luck and it was a sign from, I don't know, nature or God or the angels or something. I don't know what it was. The whole conversation on Facebook completely changed. Now everybody was very, very happy that this woman had a Luna Moth. Um, what can you say? A few words can really change a conversation. Making people understand how important these insects are or how harmless they are um, can really, really help. Um, this is what the caterpillar looks like down here. Uh, I got both of these pictures um, from the University of Florida site. I did not have these photos myself to add to the slide. And this is actually what the, uh, the cocoon looks like. Uh, like a great many of the giant moths, the giant silk moths, it wraps its cocoon with some leaves, which if you look at that, uh, you could see how that would be very easy to accidentally throw that out while you were cleaning up your garden. And wouldn't that be a shame? Now, this, I think, is my favorite slide of the entire presentation because Kathy Skinner of Weymouth Township, she gets the best photobomb award. Well, yes, that's an imperial moth, but look at that lovely dog looking out the screen behind that moth. Isn't that a fabulous, fabulous picture? <laughs> imperial moths are indeed huge. They can have a three to seven inch wingspan and their caterpillars are really quite amazing. This enormous caterpillar here, it's in the picture. I actually took the picture of the caterpillar. It was up in an Eastern red cedar and I discovered the caterpillar because I was working below it and I found frass pellets, that is caterpillar poop. Um, those of you that do wordle, frass, F-R-A-S-S, -S, interesting wordle word. And they were these enormous frass pellets. They were the size of pencil erasers. I was like, if the frass is this big, there must be an enormous caterpillar up there. And so there was, uh, it was this very caterpillar. Imperial moths actually, although they have quite a different, a lot of different plants they'll feed on, there are different subspecies that feed on different hosts. The only imperial moths that I've seen on my property have been either uh, the caterpillar in the red cedar here toward the back of the property or up in the front of the property. I also found um, a pair of mating uh, imperial moths one time right underneath a white pine, which tells me that we have the Eccles imperialis peeny subspecies on our property. But the, many of the other subspecies also exist in New Jersey. But again, 
I just love this photobomb picture. Um, so well done, Kathy. I hope you're on the call tonight. Another interesting moth. Last year, last year, we talked about the snowberry clearwing. This year, I thought I'd put in the hummingbird clearwing moth. It's another one of these day flying moths that confuses people. Um, they fly very, very rapidly. Um, most people think that they are strangely chunky hummingbirds that they've never seen. If you have a field that's got, or a garden with a lot of Monarda in it, wild bergamot, um, you can have dozens and dozens of these flying around. They really, really like to nectar on wild bergamot, but obviously also are perfectly happy with swamp milkweed as in the picture here. Um, caterpillar hosts include our native honeysuckles, not the invasive ones, snowberry, hawthorns, cherries, plums, and viburnums. The eggs here in the lower right-hand corner, that's on viburnum dentatum. I actually watched the moth uh, lay those eggs. It was right outside my office window one year. Imaris Thisbe. Oh, and Eastern tent caterpillars. Well, what can we say about them? It's interesting to note that no one sent me a picture of the tents that they make. These are the ones that we see, particularly in cherry trees. They love cherry and apple. Put the big tents, silken tents, that will contain hundreds of caterpillars. The silken tents actually protect them from predation so that the birds don't come after them. Um, actually, the caterpillars are pretty hairy. You can see that um, here. Where's my pointer? Lost my pointer. There's my pointer. Um, you can see that in this picture here from Emily, um, that they're, they're really quite hairy. Birds really don't like to eat them, even if they get them outside the silken web. Um, this is what the pupa looks like. They, the pupa is actually inside there. It makes this hairy case. But this was the picture I was really impressed with. Suzanne came up with because she took the picture of the egg cases. Um, a lot of people will see this on um, an apple stem, a cherry stem, a plum stem, and they don't know what those are. And those are all, all egg masses of Eastern tent caterpillars, which can do quite a lot of damage. And then of course, I wanted to tell, show people what the actual moth looks like. It's a pretty little brown moth with stripes. Very pretty, as a matter of fact. And this, Penny McMacken, McMeekin, sorry, what a wonderful shot. It's a tulip tree silk moth. We don't usually see tulip tree silk moths very often. Um, it's a big insect. It's about four inches across. Again, like all the silk moths, the adults or most of the silk moths, the adults don't feed at all. It only has a single host plant, tulip poplar. That is it. Um, the cocoons are spun in a curled leaf that drops to the ground. If we clean up too well underneath our tulip poplars, we're not going to have tulip tree poplar moth or tulip tree silk moths. The other reason we don't see a lot of our giant silk moths is that in the early 1900s, we spent an awful lot, we as a people, um, we spent a lot of energy, um, government entities mainly, introducing a parasitic fly to go after several different insect pests, but particularly spongy moth. They were really hoping to be able to control spongy moth, formerly known as the gypsy moth, which is a silk moth. It's not a very good silk moth, but it is a silk moth. Um, well, the, the, the parasitic fly really doesn't do much good on the on spongy moth at all, but it liked the rest of our silk moths. So a lot of our silk moths now become parasitized by this introduced fly that we introduced on purpose to try to protect or try to control an insect pest. Polyphemus moth is another one of our enormous silk moths. Uh, this picture um, comes from uh, Emily Harris McGeehan again. Uh, apparently I can pronounce insect names better than I can pronounce people's names. I apologize for anybody's names that I'm butchering. Um, you can actually see that this is a female. She's a little beat up. This is a this is an older specimen. You can see she's been out and about for a while, but you can tell that it's a female because she has skinny antennae. The males have very big puffy antennae, 
that they use to, quite frankly, help them find the females. And then this is a picture of the cocoon in the winter. You can see with the snow on it, and this is just attached to a branch uh, down along the Delaware River, actually, where I took that picture. These moths are four to six inches across, um, and they feed on a variety of plants, including dogwood and hazel and birch. At the end of the day, you know, we really like our butterflies, large or small. We're happy to see them. This this is the gray hair streak, uh, also known interestingly as the beanless cenid, because it will feed on green beans. Here's a really nice picture of the caterpillar feeding on green beans from Lucy Hooper. And Charlie here has given us a picture of what you normally see, a gray hair streak, because gray hair streaks, most of the hair streaks, they usually sit with their wings folded up. You rarely see them sitting on something like mountain mint here with Eric's picture um, with its wings spread, but that's because there's something going on here. What is that? That's not part of the mountain mint. I expect some of you have some guesses. That is an ambush bug nymph that Eric took a picture of. That was there on the mountain mint doing what ambush bugs do. They ambush. And they're really quite good at it. Ambush bugs grab, hold, and suck the juices out of insects. And they're everywhere, as the name would imply. Here's a picture of a jagged ambush bug on blue mist flower. You can see, oh, look at that adorable little face. Look at that in there, hiding, waiting for an insect to come along. Here's a jagged ambush bug, another picture by Eric. And this one actually shows off those front legs really well. So those front legs, let me point out to them here. Let's see, these, I mean, it's like Arnold Schwarzenegger arms there. So these are called raptorial front legs, just like praying mantises have. And that's what they can grab and hold on to their prey. Obviously, you look at the size of that flower, they're not very big insects, but they are, in fact, everywhere. And there are a lot of insects that are simply hiding in plain sight all around us. This is a particularly fabulous set of pictures um, that was sent in uh, by Lan Jen Tsai. I just love these. This is a pediculate spindle midge gall in a lance leaf goldenrod flower. So here's the flower. Here's the gall. Here's the inside of the gall with the pupa. And way up here in the corner, you can see where the midge is emerging. These midges are so tiny. Their wingspan is only two and a half millimeters. Gold bronze are actually host to a lot of different galling insects. And one of the really interesting things about galling insects is that they basically trick plants into creating the perfect protected spot for them to rear their young. While the larvae of the gall midge is inside the gall, predators are not going to get to it. It's a perfect place to hide. Other insects that hide in plain sight are things that we simply ignore. We don't even realize they're there. These are robber flies. A lot of people are afraid of robber flies. Jacqueline sent a wonderful picture of a robber fly with a wasp. They are excellent hunters. They are amazing on the wing and they're tiny. This male white bearded robber fly that I took a picture of, this was, I don't know if you guys can see anything, but this was sitting on the tip of my glasses. So that's what that's sitting on there. They are absolutely amazing flyers and excellent aerial hunters, but a lot of people are afraid of them because they pay no attention to us. You know, they will, they will land on us, they will, they will land near us, and people think that they're going, to, they're going to bite you. They're looking to catch insects on the wing. Hey, 
paper wasps are another set of amazing predators, quite frankly. Um, Emily did a great job of taking this wonderful close up of paper wasps. Now I will convince, I, I will confess to you, I am not an expert at identifying wasps based on looking at the heads of the larvae in their nests. Not my speciality, but I can tell you that two of our most common paper wasps that are found in the East are the European paper wasp and the Northern paper wasp. So the European paper wasp according to Cornell, is in fact the most common paper wasp in the eastern United States, even though it is not native. As a matter of fact, it has crowded out the northern paper wasp, which is this one on the right here. So you see a lot less of these and a lot more of these now, which is a shame. Um, we tend to think since a lot of us on here are, are, are insect people, it's the Native Plant Society of New Jersey. After all, we're, we're native plant people. And we tend to think about you know, invasive species. We think of invasive plants pushing out and, and removing habitat that native plants should be in. Um, but invasive insects do a similar thing. Um, there's an invasive lady beetle, the one that mostly is probably all over your house right now. Um, they were introduced from Asia um, intentionally as a biological control agent. I don't know how the European paper wasp got here, but um, it is a shame when we have invasive insects um, that cause just at least a similar sort of havoc uh, that invasive plants do in our habitats. Now, the paper wasps are pretty obvious predators. Long-legged flies. I suspect most of you have never heard of a long-legged fly. Um, I don't think they even talked about them very much when I was in school for entomology. Um, but they're actually, first of all, they're beautiful little things. Uh, this particular one um, has these wonderful, uh, just, Almost, it almost glows when you see it in person. Uh, Peter Crowell took a picture of this, both in Pittstown and in Belleville. Um, one was sitting on a, on a seat um, and the other one actually sitting in a little more natural setting. But long-legged flies are wonderful predators on, on really small invertebrates, columblins, which are tiny, tiny things, aphids, and the larvae of earthworms of all things. Beautiful little creatures. Another insect predator that hides in plain sight are the serpent fly larvae. So in your lower left-hand corner, here the picture here from Maya. This is a serpent fly on goldenrod. Um, serpent flies are beautiful little insects. They're also known as hoverflies. Um, if you've ever been out in the garden and there's just a little thing that looks sort of like a bee, but isn't, and it's just hovering around in front of your face, that would be a hoverfly, flowerfly, serpent fly. The adults are actually very important pollinators of a lot of different plants, including onions and strawberries. The larvae, however, which are a type of maggot, they're free roaming, amazing predators. And they will crawl around something that looks like this with oleander aphids, and they will just walk up on them and suck the juices right out of them. One of the most amazing things that I've ever discovered uh, on my own about surfer flies is the fact that, all right, so so you have this little maggot here, fine. You know, the fact that you have maggots crawling around your leaves, but it's a good thing. They're predators. Be happy with that. When I was still at the USDA, we were raising aphids in a greenhouse for research, and our aphid population was crashing. You know, why are all our aphids dying? The population was just going down and down and down. I looked in the greenhouse. Well, our greenhouse had become infested with surf and fly larvae maggots. So I took a couple into the lab to look at them under a microscope to see if I could identify them by just looking at the, the larvae, the maggots. No, I could not identify them to species. But what I did discover is that if you put a surfer fly larvae in a really 
one of these maggots in a very unhappy situation that is in a microscope with a bright light shining on it. So it's very hot, very warm, very intense. It squishes itself up almost like an inchworm and then pops itself away. It just leapt out from underneath the microscope. It leapt almost a foot away, um, which led us to have a lot of jokes about leaping maggots for a while in the lab. But uh, certainly the other entomologists in the lab, none of us had any idea that um, a surfeit fly larva could leap uh, to get away from danger. It was pretty interesting to see. Another interesting predator that we don't tend to think about are the stink bugs. Ever since the marmorated stink bug was introduced, the only thing we think about with stink bugs is marmorated stink bugs, which they're an invasive species. They were introduced not too far from here, originally spotted in Allentown, Pennsylvania, actually. Um, and yes, they're, they're, they're both a pest of orchards. They're also a pest in our houses. Um, but stink bugs come in both plant feeding and insect feeding. Uh, this is a spine soldier bug nymph uh, feeding on a spotted lanternfly. Isn't that a lovely thing to see? Um, and one of the really interesting things is that the spine soldier bugs, they are predators from the time they hatch. These are their eggs that they've just come out of. And these tiny things, they are smaller than, well, maybe half the size of the end of a pencil eraser. And they are predatory from the get-go. But of course, sometimes also the hunters may be hunted. Again, Lan Jensai and Prince and Junction sent in this wonderful, wonderful picture of stink bug eggs that have been parasitized by a Trisulcus wasp. Wonderful photography. Which made me think about this little, uh, it is National Poetry Month, and I'm, I'm, I think calling this a poem is, is a bit of a stretch, but this, this little ditty um, by the 19th century mathematician, big fleas have little fleas upon their backs to bite them, and little fleas have lesser fleas, and so on, ad infinitum. Every entomologist knows that. Um, but this is really an extraordinary photo um, that... Lan Jen took, and I was so happy that she could share it with us. And as long as we're talking spotted lanternflies and death to spotted lanternflies, even the plants themselves sometimes can be hunters. This is a great a picture, again, by Lan Jen of a spotted lanternfly being uh, consumed by threadleaf sundew, which of course are insectivorous plants. Another fabulous picture. But, you know, you, even insect feeders, sorry, plant feeders hide amongst us. Um, this is a northern walking stick. Um, they feed on leaves. They tend to feed between nine o'clock in the evening and three o'clock in the morning. So, you know, you, you don't really notice them too much. They tend to be up in the canopy. One of the most extraordinary camping trips I was on from an insect point of view um, was probably, oh, I don't know, 35 years ago, um, near the Appalachian Trail in Pennsylvania. We woke up in the morning and there were walking stick insects everywhere. They were all over our tents. They were all over the campground. They were, they were just everywhere. Um, they were mating, they were eating, they were laying eggs. They were having a lovely time and I didn't have my camera. So I don't have a single picture of them. Um, but Northern walking sticks, well, most walking sticks, they have no wings at all. Um, so they disperse very, very slowly. Um, you know, these will get up to, oh, maybe three inches long or so. The giant walking stick, which is native to um, the Southeast, it's Alabama, I think it was in Texas and a few other states. It can actually grow up to 15 inches long. That's a big walking stick a very big walking stick. But although, you know, the walking sticks, they hide in plain sight. Some of the insects that feed on plants, it looks like they're shouting for attention. This is the locust borer beetle. Beetle grubs feed on black locusts. The beetles love 
goldenrod pollen. If there is goldenrod around and there's locust borer beetles around, they will be on the goldenrod. And it's an extraordinary looking beetle. But what we don't tend to think about is yes, but the, but the grubs hide really well. This is the damage done. These are the grubs and these are the frass filled cavities. Um, in black locust. Now black locust is, depending on who you talk to, we're right on the edge of the native range of black locust. It is invasive beyond its native range. Uh, black locust fixes nitrogen. So when it moves into a forest, it actually changes the soil of the forest. So um, some maps say it's native New Jersey, some maps say it, it isn't. I'm not going to go into a whole discussion of whether or not black locust is native to New Jersey or not. But I will tell you that if it is around, or if you see these beetles around, then you've got black locust around as well. And they are beautiful beetles. A few other groups very briefly. This is the dogwood sawfly uh, on pagoda dogwood. I think I'm running short on time, so I'm gonna move a little bit quicker here. Sawflies, they look like caterpillars, don't they? This is what they look like when they're young. This is the fluffy stage. They get a little older, they look like this. But the adults are actually a wasp um, that lays its eggs in leaves. Here's a dogwood sawfly eggs in a dogwood leaf. Um, they have a pretty, they only feed on dogwoods. Um, a lot of sawflies actually insert their eggs into the edge of a leaf. Uh, I did a bunch of research on them for my master's degree when I was working on a uh, sawfly species that fed on wheat on the eastern shore of Maryland. This is the azalea sawfly, Eura lepofskii uh, on rhododendron. It's found throughout the east as far west as Wisconsin. And it was originally described by Dave Smith in 1974. And I wanted to give him a shout out because Dave Smith was the one that helped me identify the sawfly I was working on on the Eastern shore of Maryland back when I was working on my master's degree at the University of Maryland. And uh, at least when um, uh, a couple of years ago, Dave Smith was still, um, he was involved in bug guides, still answering questions about sawflies. A lot of sawflies hide much better than the uh, dogwood sawfly. Here we have the azalea sawfly feeding on the flower of a rhododendron, picture from Chris Murrow. And this is also Chris's picture. And here you see, it's a bit hard to see, but you see that line right there? That is also a sawfly uh, hiding in plain sight, feeding away. Uh, certainly that is what the introduced um, columbine sawfly, the European columbine sawfly, which is doing a lot of damage to our columbines does. Uh, it, it's the same color as the leaves and it's hard to see, uh, not nearly as, as obvious as the dogwood sawfly. And now we come back to the milkweed leaf beetle. This was the beetle that was on the very first picture from Lucy Hooper. This is a different picture also from Lucy in the middle here. This one's on purple milkweed. Um, I threw in a picture that I had of them laying eggs and the larvae look like this. Um, they're very, very closely related to Colorado potato beetles. Um, if you've ever grown potatoes in your garden, you know what a Colorado potato beetle looks like, uh, larvae looks like, and it is extremely similar. Both the adults and grubs feed almost exclusively on milkweed and a few other close related plants. and. I've never seen them fly and doing some research on this prior to this presentation, I found several people said no one's ever really seen these things fly, maybe hop a few inches. So they don't really spread very much. Um, you're either going to have them or you're not. They sort of look like giant lady beetles, really. Pretty little insects. And then finally, you know, couldn't get done without talking a little bit about milkweeds. It's a fabulous picture by Maya. Uh, Maya Baldwin from Highbridge with the monarch caterpillar on the butterfly milkweed. And also we have this picture from Ocean Township with the monarch pupa. But one of the points I want to leave you with is we, 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 we want to embrace all these different insects. And even when we're talking about milkweeds, the reason for milkweeds to be in our world, to be in our gardens, to be in our forests and meadows, isn't just for monarchs. 
It's to support a whole group of insects. You know, yes, the milkweed leaf beetles, the monarchs, of course. Here's a monarch. Again, this is Sarah and Chris's picture, again from Ocean Township. This is that pupa that has just emerged. But also, you know, this picture from Lucy Hooper, which also has, you know, the pair of small milkweed bugs over here on the side. You know, these are small milkweed bugs, not box elder bugs, not only because they're on milkweed, but also because they have the little black hearts on this back. The black hearts tell you that it's a small milkweed bug. There are so many different native plants and so many creatures depending upon them. Um, this slide keeps getting more and more complicated, but these are just some of the really fabulous resources um, that I like to use to try to identify things. Uh, looks like I do have a, a unfortunate, um, uh, there was a break right there. So the Field Guide to Flower Flies in Northeast North America, that is the Princeton Field Guide 118. So that wrapped a little bit weirdly there. But this is a wonderful list of resources, both websites and books that can really help you identify some of the insects in your garden and, and, and what they're doing there, you know, what their life history is. And I hope that while you're planting your native gardens and admiring native plants in the wild, you'll really look at some of the creatures that rely on them and what how they're using them. Thanks again so much, so much, so much for sending in all your pictures for this presentation. Um, I think Mike's coming back up there and uh, I think we have a little bit of time for some questions, don't we, Mike? We do, we do. Uh, I, I think people are stunned by these pictures. <laughs> well, so, like, so was I when people sent them in, Mike. They yeah. are so amazing. They're like professional quality pictures. It's like David Attenborough took them. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's uh, it's just been a joy to work with a lot of the photos that have come in. And I, you know, I remember uh, last year I had a, uh, a beach plum in my yard and it started to get infested by aphids. And I believe you identified them as they, they were a non- non-native invasive aphid, um, you know, in the leaves, they started getting covered with the frass and with the honeydew and- Oh, probably the damps and plum aphids. And and, the, and it was like looking worse and worse every day, you know, I was debating what to do. I certainly don't want to put chemicals on it. Should I like hose it off or something? And then all of a sudden one day, the little ladybug larva. <laughs> yes. And, and they started- you know, they started doing their thing. And before I knew it, there were adult ladybugs, the nymph ladybugs, the, 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 the larva guys, they were all over it and more and more. And then one day we got a good rain and it washed everything off and all the aphids were gone. Things didn't look so bad anymore. Yeah. And it just, you know, completely natural cycle that if you, if you have the, the biodiversity and the habitat for it that that you support those those predator ones you know they'll be able to come in and and help you out you, well, you know, know another interesting thing about aphids mike um which uh and 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 i'm not i i really like talking about aphids and nobody sent in any aphid pictures this time so i i didn't uh i didn't talk about aphids much but a lot of aphids have a winter host and a summer host and the winter host is a woody plant Wow. So they actually, the male and female mate in the fall, they only make males once a year. They're not around very long. They do what they got to do. They're done. All the rest of the aphids you see the rest of the year are females. But they lay their eggs on a woody host in the fall. Those called stem mothers, they emerge in the spring. And they're all females. And they all start developing, dropping their daughters because they don't need to mate. And they're they're born with their with their daughters in them. It's called parthenogenesis. So the population builds up really fast. And then they develop a generation that has wings and they all fly off to the summer host. And then they come back in the fall when the males are produced and lay eggs again. So it's, um, there were probably several things that were going on there, but certainly the uh, lady beetles were having a feast, certainly helped to um, make your beach plum a little bit happier. 
Yeah, that's, that's an amazing thing. Everybody knows about the monarch butterflies and they migrate to Mexico and come back, you know, but like it seems like every one of these insect families, uh, you know, has something unique about it, like the, the, the winter host, the summer host, you know, and different ways they, you know, just survive and feed. It, it's it's amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And how they how they find their host plants and how they find each other to mate um how they overwinter how they hide themselves in in plain sight um so that they don't become bird food um there's there's just so many different mechanisms that insects use to try to um continue on when quite frankly most of the insects on the planet are just food for everything else <laughs> So I noticed that the one photo you had the photo of the the woolly bears in the palm of the hand. Yes. You know, so somebody asked, like, well, can you do that with all caterpillars, or some of them you don't want to touch them? You can do it with most caterpillars. Um, there are certainly some caterpillars. Um, the saddleback caterpillar, um, which is fairly notable, I think that was in our presentation last year. Um, what I tell folks, and this this is not a hard and fast rule, but if you approach a caterpillar and it arches its back toward you, or or like 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 leans in toward you, yeah, don't don't touch the caterpillars that look spiny that are trying to touch you. That's because they they have very little that they can do. But there's tiny little slug caterpillars. There's uh, hag moth caterpillars, uh, which are really quite extraordinary looking. Um, there are there are definitely some stinging caterpillars around. Most of them are going to be something like um, you know, there's probably a couple dozen species, but they're more like um touching stinging nettles. You know, it's gonna be very unpleasant for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, if anybody has ever grabbed stinging nettles by accident or um you know, I had a friend of mine who was a Boy Scout leader who hiked a bunch of Boy Scouts into a field full of stinging nettle in his shorts. I don't think he'll forget what stinging nettle looks like again. Um, but uh, you know, it's a it's a learning experience sometimes. But yeah, you know, caterpillars. Uh, most caterpillars are safe to handle, but you have to remember that any insects. Um, Think about it from the insect's point of view. You know, it, they're, they're trying not to become food. So, you know, any insect that you pick up is probably thinks you're trying to eat it. Lady beetles do something called reflexive bleeding. If you harass a lady beetle, it will bleed yellow from the joints. And yeah. that 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 hemolymph, that blood is is caustic, you know. Um, it doesn't mean lady beetles are evil. It means that, you know, they weigh a fraction of an ounce and you weigh 150 pounds and it's afraid of you and is trying to get away. Um, so, yes, sometimes sometimes insects would rather not be picked up. So just just admire them. Yeah. Just admire them. You know, it's always fun when you're doing a program with children and you pick up an insect trying to tell them how harmless it is, harmless it is and it bites you. Um, you know, I, I had I had a kitty did do that one time. I picked it up by the wings in the back, thinking that it couldn't reach me with its mouth. I was wrong. <laughs> oh, let's see. Um, somebody, had, this is a good, interesting question. Like sometimes you get a warm day and things start flying around, you know, like bumblebees are out and you know, other things fly around uh, and then it gets cold again. Like, yes. are, do, do, do they get killed off or do they just, you know, chill out, so to speak? Well, they, they do pretty much chill out. They are cold blooded after all. Um, so most insects will, you know, even this time of year, you know, you can see some of our native bees will fly out. Um, we get a 60 degree day. Uh, particularly if the red maples are in bloom, um, some bees will will some of our native bees will happily fly out and um, 
like nectar and pollen, um, but they're they're adapted to the area that they're, they're used to this, you know. So they will they will make it back to a protected spot. Excuse me before um, before it gets too cold for them. Uh, sometimes you will see bumblebees, particularly queen bumblebees, in the spring. Sometimes they'll get caught out a little bit, and um, you'll see them in the morning, just sort of sitting in the sun, trying to warm up enough. Um, one of the things you do see with uh, both moths and uh, bees sometimes, I'm not I'm not sure I've ever seen a butterfly do this, um, but they will sit and you'll see that they're just vibrating their wings. They're not flying, they're just vibrating their wings. And what they're doing is they're actually working their wing muscles, trying to produce enough heat to heat up their body so that they can fly. So they're actually, they're burning energy, trying to heat up enough so that they can fly away. Um, so they're they're pretty they're pretty uh, well adapted, and hopefully they have enough. Um, our native insects will have enough uh, behavioral plasticity to manage um, the vagaries of climate change as they come upon us. Uh, certainly, we just went through a very very strange warm winter, um, which is going to lead to some some things emerging perhaps earlier than they should have. Um, and when that really comes into a problem is when it's called phenology, uh, you're looking at phenology. If if you've got a specialist bee and it emerges, but it's specialist flower hasn't opened up yet mm. because the weather's been strange, then, then you've got a bit of a problem. So um, we're going to some uncharted waters on how insects are going to be able to and native plants are going to be able to manage those changes. There's some things depend on length of day, which doesn't yep. change. And some people go by the temperature, which seems to be expanding its range. Yeah. Right, right. Because they because they do both, you know. And and if you're if you're an insect or a plant for that matter, that's trying to use cues of both day length and temperature, and you're expecting a certain temperature at a certain day length and they're off, then that's also going to be giving um an organism makes signals as to what it's supposed to be doing. So someone mentions like they're always happy to see, you know, lady beetles and praying mantises in their yard. But you know, we know about the the Chinese mantis, and you mentioned that most likely the lady beetle you see is is introduced. Um, you know, is that a big problem? Like, well. Depends on who you are, really, I suppose. So the, I believe the state insect or the state beetle, I'm not sure which, of New York State is the 10-spotted lady beetle. Um, and the 10-spotted lady beetle has been almost entirely supplanted by the introduced Asian lady beetle. Um, they've just reproduced faster and they've, they're, they're pushy. Um, They've taken over the overwintering locations, which despite what you may think, lady beetles do not naturally overwinter in your house. <laughs> what they would normally do in the wild is they would find, you know, a, a, a spot in a brush pile behind a piece of loose bark someplace. They would find a good place to overwinter. And then they'd, they'd sort of, you know, let out some pheromones and tell their friends. It's like, hey, I found a great spot. All well, their friends would come together and then you'd have sort of this, 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 bunch of lady beetles they're overall all overwintering together um well the asian lady beetles seem to be particularly well adapted to figuring out that our houses are better than the gap behind the loose bark on the tree so you know you get some asian lady beetles in your house they're like oh boy did i find a great place usually under siding or something like that and then they they telegraph it and all their friends come and then when it they try to leave they take a wrong turn and instead of leaving they come into our houses and then we have lady beetles all over our house which really upsets some people they're not going to hurt you you know despite the reflex of bleeding they're not really that's 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 not a that's not going to be a problem and they're not going to they're not going to make your dog sick but you know nobody well that's not true most people do not enjoy their house crawling with insects Uh, somebody asked, do insects, uh, are there any insects that, you know, go to skunk cabbage? Sure, actually there are. 
Well, there's um, probably a reason it smells that way, attracts certain. Well, it does, it does attract, well, the, the flowers don't smell too horrible, but they're, they are mostly pollinated by flies. Um, but they also have a lot of really great pollen. So um, for, for people who keep honeybees, um, honeybees really like skunk cabbage because skunk cabbage can produce actually quite a lot of heat. It actually will melt the snow off the top um, so it can flower. And so it's, honeybees are not native. Honeybees are mostly Italian, Mediterranean fellows. Um, there's a couple other species that have been mixed in to create um, functional honeybees, but we, North America has no native honeybees. So all the honeybees that are out there um, are, are functionally domesticated animals in North America. Um, and since they're from the Mediterranean, they get a little confused sometimes when we have a really warm day in February and they all go out and they decide it's a wonderful day and they're going to party and then it gets cold and there's nothing flowering for them. Um, so they actually really like skunk cabbage because they'll go into skunk cabbage. It's, it's like a little warming hut. You know, yeah. they go in, they warm up, they sidle up to the bar, have a little pollen. It's lovely. And then they fly back to their back to their hive. I've, I've, I've never seen that promoted, though, is <laughs> young cabbage honey. Well, no, because it's pollen. There's no nectar, the pollen that they're after. And the other problem with, with producing skunk cabbage, and it's it's a species actually we work on at Toad Shade some, and it's, it's a bit problematic. So um, the root of skunk cabbage, a mature skunk cabbage, the root is, is enormous. Like, like it is, it is, you know, six, seven feet across. Um, so you really need to get skunk cabbages. If you're going to put them into a garden, you need to get them when they're very, very small. Um, and let that giant root system develop in place. Um, really, nobody's nobody's going to ship a six or or pick up a six foot wide pot of skunk cabbage and move it into the garden unless I don't know who's I don't know who would be doing that. But um, but they are really interesting plants. I quite like them. I grew up with a bunch of them right behind my house. Yeah, I, I saw a few today, back off the road in the wet areas. Should check it out. Uh, so I think let's, you know, get ready to wrap it up. Uh, I think that the single most important question here is the, that Imperial Moth Caterpillar. You, you didn't have to get a picture of that frass, did you? I didn't get a picture of the frass. I will get it. But, but literally, it's about the size of a pencil eraser. And I, I need to get a picture of frass pellets because uh, they're... Frass pellets are very distinctive looking. Um, uh, they come in all different sizes, but most caterpillar frass pellets are are fairly distinctive. There's one insect, I'm trying to remember who it is, but there's there's a sort of squared off, but mostly they're, they're, they're very desiccated. You know, they get all the moisture out of them. They're not, it's not really a runny situation. You've got these very distinct little um, packages. Um, but literally, um, if you think of the end of, you know, a number two, an old, old number two pencil and the pencil eraser on the end. That was the size of those frass pellets. And I will, I will endeavor to, um, there's yeah, always, would, there's always no pictures that. to take. I would expect that from a rabbit or something, but like. <laughs> well, but they're not round. They're, they're, they're really, mm -hmm. um, they're really very convoluted looking. I will have to, I will, I will make an effort this summer to take frass pellet pictures. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we can have some for next year. And uh, yeah, I encourage everybody out there, you know, like you saw all these pictures, you know, pay attention in your backyards, you know, keep your iPhone with you. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, if the, and if the caterpillar's arching its back at you, just take a picture. Don't touch that one. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you again so much, Randy. Another wonderful presentation. Well, thanks again for doing this. Uh, the, um, I really have to just thank our membership um, who sent in all the photos because uh, this presentation, the one I did last year, uh, would not have come together without all the fabulous photos folks sent in. Yeah, it was a group effort. Okay, thank you again. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. See you next month.